right, good afternoon, good evening, afternoon, one of those things. Good day, ladies and gentlemen of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, glad you're here, uh, hopefully you're here. Uh, today we have with us a uh, wonderful drummer and musician and uh, uh, inspiration and, dare I say, mentor to me for many years. Um, I've looked up to him and his playing and, and many of the groups that he's worked with um, for most of my life as a musician. Uh, this is the great Mark Ivester. And we're very happy to have him with us today. So, Mark, you, welcome. Bro. I'm going to turn my chair here. Sorry. I'm a little <laughs> okay. Welcome. Glad you could be here. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, well, there, there's many questions that I want to ask you. Um, and I wanted to start with, um, can you talk a little bit about what got you started to, started playing, begin playing music, you know, and decide to want to become a musician? Sure. Uh, you know, I was a typical uh pots and pans uh kid you know baby uh <laughs> and in fact my uh, uh the neighbor lady uh came over and scolded my mother for letting me get the pots and pans out and you know <laughs> uh anyway that, that so i hear uh <laughs> uh but uh I, you know i think there was there was a day in the, in the fifth grade you know when there was an announcement made and they just said, you know, if you want to play trombone, go to room 26, and, you know, if you want to play drums, go to room 21, and or, you know, so on, and I just, just kind of like, oh, yeah, I want to play drums, <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of where it started, it was just, you know, grade school band, <clears throat> before that, I think, I think I just, you know, kind of liked music, um, and I'd watch I'd watch the drummers, uh, you know, if if I had a chance to see a, a parade or or something, you know, I'd always be kind of fascinated by by the drums. Um, uh, and then I, I think also when when I was in grade school, like the junior high school band came and played at the grade school, and it was a really strong program where, where I grew up and. I mean, the the junior high band was was. <laughs> I thought it was awesome, you know, at that time. Where, where did you grow up? Uh, this was Spokane, Spokane, Washington. Yeah, out in the valley, and um, and anyway, I I remember being just really amazed by the sound of the the concert band, you know, the the junior high school band. It was just like, wow, uh, and uh, so I'm I'm sure that kind of <laughs> shook me up a little bit. And, <laughs> did, um, of course. Uh, did your parents, were they avid music lovers, listeners of music, or um, not really? They, they were music lovers, and they, they sang in the choir. My my mom uh, played piano, you know, uh, in church. Um, uh, I think my dad always wanted to be a trombonist, but uh, <laughs> never got the opportunity, really, because uh, uh, he, he loves uh, traditional jazz. Um, and they were very supportive. Uh, I think there was only one time, you know, when I made the announcement that I'm going to be a drummer, and they they said, Are "You sure you don't want to play the trumpet?" <laughs> and I was just like, "No." Nope. And that was that was you know that was the last real uh, you know question uh, about it. Well, so for me, when I got started, it was kind of similar. You know, we had. Uh, um, band in the fifth grade and then the the middle school came and they did a performance with their wind ensemble and then also their jazz band um mm. but uh um and the jazz band was more they were playing like motown things you know things of that nature um, not a whole lot of jazz that kind of came later did you um a at that point in your life was it more you had been listening to jazz or more like popular music of the day or what was your interest at that time um uh, you know I, I i probably i heard the records that were played you know at at home and and that was kind of a mixture of classical and uh you know and pop stuff uh not a lot of jazz actually um the first jazz records were really records that my drum teacher uh gave to me and that was a little later on uh, started taking drum lessons and and uh and uh, you know in the beginning it was all snare drum um <clears throat> rudiments and you know marching snare drum uh, and which was a really good foundation um, but then 
I think in the ninth grade, I started playing in what was called the stage band, you know, at that time. And my teacher, my drum teacher, found out about it. You know? <laughs> and up to that point, you know, he had not let me sit down at the drum set. <clears throat> but he found out that that was happening. So he said, okay, I guess it's time. Um, and he sent me home with, with a few records. Uh, one was a Buddy Rich record. And one was... Uh, Night Train, Oscar Peterson, oh, yeah. and the other one was a, a Thelonious Monk record. Yeah. You know, pretty wide uh, you know, variety, but all of them had something that kind of, you know, grabbed me. Yeah, um, yeah and, and that's, so that was early inspiration, definitely. So then, yeah, no, uh, definitely. Um, Well, like in most, I think, uh, kids when they're taking, um, you know, band uh, elementary school, middle school, you do the snare and maybe wood blocks and cymbals and bells, and did yeah. you, you've done all of all of that stuff as well, or? Oh yeah, yeah, and um, you know I was in a drum and bugle corps, and when you start, they you know they give you the cymbals, and um, then you know from there you work up to bass drum and and, and you know tenor drums, or, and finally you know snare drum. Um, so, you know, I kind of got through the, uh, the process and, uh, got into, to that. Uh, but always in, in school, I always played in orchestra and concert band and, um, of course, jazz band. I have questions uh, about that too, but I'm going to go back to your teacher and the, the, the records that you had. So, um, when you first started kind of becoming aware of jazz, um, like all of us did at some point, you just get an, an entry point and then you just like start growing from there who were some of your favorite uh, drummers that when you were first getting started like you really enjoyed their playing uh, uh buddy rich was of course an, an influence you know and uh you know i uh, my my dad would let me stay up if he was going to be on the carson you know johnny carson the tonight show you know i could stay up and watch him uh so uh definitely um, you know and also because I was playing snare drum and and rudiments and and Buddy Rich had that technique, you know, those chops and um, facility. So that that was impressive to me, you know, in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> but then, you know, I, then I I started to check out other bands and um, you know smaller groups, Coltrane and Miles. And, um, started to listen to Tony and Elvin, you know, oh, yeah. uh, so yeah, that, that was kind of the next step. Okay. All right. Well, so then, um, uh, middle school, high school, you're taking drum lessons, you're, you're studying with the teacher, um, mm -hmm. you're listening to albums. Were there any opportunities, um, for you in Spokane when you were growing up to play or be around musicians, older musicians that were playing, you know, gigging? Um, a little bit um, when I got to college in, in high school, you know, it was just it was just the jazz band. It was big band, and you know, we we had a great time, you know, playing in the jazz band, the big band. It was it was good. We went to festivals in uh, Bremerton, you know, the Olympic College uh, Festival and uh, festival down at the uh, University of Idaho in Moscow. Uh, we went to those festivals and you know played and competed and you know, all that um <clears throat> uh so i you know i didn't really do like professional gigs until i got to college and then i had i met some people and you know and got different opportunities to play not always jazz you know i did some country gigs in the oh, yeah. the basement of the the moose lodge you know <laughs> yeah, well th those things. are those are the gigs right don't mess up don't fool with the dancers make sure they can dance otherwise That's there's right. going to be trouble keep it simple yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so and you went to i was reading on your um your bio earlier you went to eastern washington university also you know, i did out there yeah um yeah. and so who was on the faculty when you were out there at the time well my main mentor there was uh marty ziskowski he was the um, percussionist. He was the uh, principal percussionist with the Spokane uh, Symphony timpanist, and um, you know, really a great musician. Uh, and percussion ensemble was really one of my favorite things. Um, uh, classes and and groups, you know, there at, at Eastern, we had a great time. 
and a really a great bunch of percussionist drummers that hung out lived together you know partied together uh, you know yeah. just i was it was a really good uh environment you know that way um and then really you know so marty was on the faculty and, and very you know important uh but there was another, another guy that i was uh, influenced by and his name was tom kelly and he was a drummer in Spokane. He had spent time in New York City in the 60s, kind of the heyday of the, the loft um, sessions and, and uh, you know, a lot of avant-garde and, you know, um, really progressive stuff. And I heard him play drums, and it was just like, oh, my gosh, that's, you know, that's the kind of bebop, drumming that I want, I want to do, you know, uh, it was just really, um, it was a, a big influence. And then, you know, a couple of years after that, he, he played piano or he, he kind of wanted to not play drums so much. And he started playing a lot of piano. And so we had a, a quartet, um, and he played piano and I got to play drums. <laughs> and I'm sure a benefit from his from his uh, oh, yeah. wisdom and, and of course, experience. You know, and oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there was definitely um, a lot of inspiration and, and influence there. It, it's funny you mentioned that, um, you know, talking with all these different musicians, and, and not just for these interview series, but just over the course of my life, um, there always seems to be um, some moment where something just kind of clicks, particularly when you're watching another musician um, and you're like, I want to be able to do that. It's, and it's an intangible thing. It's something about the energy and the sound of the music, not only the way that they're playing it, but it, the way that you react and the way that it makes you feel. Yeah. Um, and it's for, for me, you know, talking with a lot of other musicians, and I'm, I'm sure you have too, a big part of any working band is the drummer. I mean, that's it's that the energy and the feel and the drive and or... or um, uh, the colors that they play with, the atta- all that, you know, it's it makes a big um, makes a big deal. Is there uh, when you're working with drummers trying to explain that stuff? Like anytime anyone's trying to work with a student, trying to explain those things, it's it's difficult because you can play the right notes, you can play the right time, all that kind of stuff, but it could still not feel correct, you know. So um, how yeah. how do you deal with explaining that to students when you're exactly. working with people? Exactly. Um, well, you know, at, at the time that that inspiration occurred to me. Um, I was studying and I was practicing, you know, um, this bebop coordination, you know, and so I know uh, I sort of understood what the the technique was, but I'd really never seen it, you know, happening and in a musical situation, um, and and it was just so cool to just like, oh, that's that's why it's it's useful and you know, <laughs> musical and um so yeah that's that's the tough transition to make from just playing exercises to you know using that skill that you developed in you know in an ensemble and you know listening and and feeding off other players and that's that's a tough thing um I guess uh, I just hope that they'll have opportunities to do that and experience that. Um, and, you know, you, the, the kinds of things that you do with all your students and um, your groups, you know, that's really a, a wonderful thing, I think, because they get to come and hear players and then they get to sit in. And, and you know, not right now. Try this, <laughs> you know, not now. Yeah, it'll 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 come back. Yeah. It has to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember having a conversation with you, and and I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the interview. Um, Mark is a wonderful educator, and he's taught at several schools. Um, it, they're listed in his bio at the beginning of this post. But he also um, he lives in Gig Harbor and teaches um, at Ted Brown Music, and has been teaching for quite some time, as well as uh, Pacific Lutheran Uni- University. You're still there teaching yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Um, if you want to benefit from his experience in education, uh, get in touch with him. Mm-hmm. I, you're on the website of Ted Brown, I'm sure. Um, and sure, then, uh, sure. are you doing any online teaching as well currently, or not really? Yeah, you that's are. really all I'm doing um, right now is online. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, and if, you know, 
Give me a call. Yeah, please do. You, <laughs> I've taken, I think, at least one lesson trying to – I need more. Like a couple. It's, yeah, so – and they're, they're very cool. Um, anyways, uh, we were talking about swing feel, and I hadn't had this conclusion before, but um, you brought it to my attention, and I think it's, it's – um, a good thing to keep in the back of your brain if you're particularly if you're playing jazz we had talked about swing feel and how a lot of times you know the way swung eighth notes are um, taught is basically we see two eighth notes but we feel them as three triplets the first part of the beat the downbeat is the first two part of the triplets um, and the last the upbeat is the last part of the triplet but the way you were explaining it is er drummers feel it differently some you know that would be like you know um, two-thirds and a third but some drummers it's more of like a 60 percent 40 percent in how they um phrase their eighth notes which i thought i hadn't thought about that before and it made a lot yeah. of sense so can you can you speak to that a little bit sure sure um you know there's there's probably a, a, a some way to um analyze uh the space you know between quarter notes and um and swing eighth notes um uh, and you know very mathematically uh but uh you know, I you know, and I noticed it. Different drummers have different sw swing feels. You know, even just when they're playing the basic um, swing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> do da da do da da. Um, you know, s sometimes it's it's a little more compressed, and sometimes it's more open and. Um, you know, uh, it's it, that's kind of one of the things that gives those players their uh, sound and, and their their feel and uh, you know their identity. Um, and and it's also a really cool thing because not everybody in the group has to have exactly the same swing feel for it to work. You know, uh, but anyway. Um, uh, the math part of it is, you know, between two beats, if you consider that a hundred cents or you know, yeah. <laughs> degrees or whatever, a hundred between beats, then of course a, a perfectly even eighth note in between, you'd have 50-50, right? And, and then if you're, like you mentioned, a, a triplet, you know, a first and third would be 66, 33. And that's a very common uh, thing, you know, that, that triplet y kind of flow happens a lot. Yeah, um, I think a lot, <coughs> to interject, I think a lot, the reason that it's taught that way, it's, it's easier for people to visualize and, and see it that way on like a staff um, conceptually. That's yeah. just my opinion. I'm, sure. Feel free to. Sure, to, absolutely. And sometimes it's just written that way, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you've probably seen the ride symbol pattern written uh, quarter dotted eight sixteenth you know right. that way which too is really which stiff is, really stiff well, well it, it's it's 75 25 right and yeah. and and sometimes it can work and feel great you know or it might might see feel, feel a little stiff yeah. uh it depends on the tempo too you know when when you get up to those tony williams tempos it's it's probably closer to 50 50 than you know 66 33 yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> uh because if you hang on to that swing thing at a really fast tempo, sometimes that feels stiff, you know. So you just have to kind of sometimes open it up and let it let it flatten out a little bit, flatten the curve. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, that's you know, different different places have have different grooves. You know, New Orleans is famous for being you know somewhere in the crack between 50 50 and um 66 33 you know it's not a com it's not just you know a shuffle uh triplet -y shuffle yeah. and it's not perfectly straight yeah. it's somewhere in there yeah. you know so if you put a number on it it, it might be 60 40 <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the reason I want to kind of go down this rabbit hole a little bit is some people that are watching know nothing about music. Other people are educators, which I think this would be helpful to know that because it helped me yeah, conceptualize yeah. this. And, and other people are players. And so um, well, I, th I think it's fascinating. Um, you know, one of my favorite drummers, uh, Albert Tootie Heath, yeah. is famous for having a really kind of even eighth swing beat. But it's not 
one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three. You know, it's it's not perfectly even, but it's definitely not Elvin Jones rolling triplet kind of right. feel either. Right. And that, that's <laughs> what I'm saying, like trying to convey that to someone. You, you can't like write it down on the page because it's something they just have to feel and internalize. And that's something yeah. that you can't, you know, it's hard to download that experience into another person's brain. They just have to kind of listen and absorb it, you know, like, like, um, matching the, the sound quality of someone's voice trying to sound like someone else you know um anyways um but there, there's a I, I always run out of time there. i'm already like halfway done with the interview um <laughs> so you play with um a lot of great groups on a regular basis when not sheltered in place i know you play quite a bit with uh jovino santos neto mm -hmm. and also with greta matassa um and both of those bands are are wonderful uh, hard-working bands that have really great concepts um so i kind of want to ask you a little bit about that um, so when did you first meet jo with Jovino and start working with him? Uh, 90, 95 maybe, 1995, around then. He he was he came to Cornish as a student, um, and then soon after converted to being a faculty member. And you then, were teaching and at Cornish College of the well, Arts at the time. Actually, I think he maybe was faculty before I got to be faculty, but it was. Right around that same same time, uh, and uh, I jammed, you know, with Chuck Deardorff and Joe Vino and Hans Teuber, and uh, and we did a, a little recording session at uh, Jack Straw, uh, and uh, and we played a gig at the Still Life in Fremont. You know, uh, this is a long time ago now, but um, it doesn't seem like that long ago. <laughs> it's just. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and that it was that was really cool because I had loved you know Brazilian um, grooves and music musicians music for a long time, uh, uh, and and I'd gotten to play some you know in different different situations, but you know Jovino was like you know out of Hermeto Pasqual and um, it's just amazing energy and uh, composition and uh, great person so. <laughs> well, he was one of my instructors at Cornerstone I was there he taught the yeah. Latin ensemble and yeah. I had some private lessons with him as well um, very energetic and um, even when he brought in his uh, arrangements demanding demanding music you know um, as far as uh, I had him in, in the role as an educator as he was a teacher you know mm -hmm. but as a as a band leader um, he always just person just him as a person he seems very easygoing very relaxed and very always positive and um, do you find working in his band is it challenging or is it fairly uh, it, easy to do or can you oh, just jump right in to do it or uh, sometimes it's very challenging and um, in fact you know there are compositions that that just never happen because <laughs> <laughs> because certain members um, <laughs> uh, just couldn't quite you know <laughs> grasp it um, but you know so there's there's challenging times and and uh, these are challenging times <laughs> Uh, yeah, odd, you know, odd time signatures and things. Uh, that's, uh, but it's, but it's really good. And he really, you know, he wrote for the musicians in the band. You know, um, he knew what our strengths were and and really kind of wrote with with the players in mind, and um, and gave us the freedom to be ourselves. Uh, you know, he he would talk about what happened in you know brazil and maybe a traditional thing a sound uh, but you know i'm from spokane washington and in you know uh i have this accent <laughs> from there you know um and and he's just open to that he, he lets people really express themselves and be who they are so uh, but at the same time you know I, i've learned so much about different brazilian styles and that men you know musicians and yeah so it's well it's like here, here in the northwest i mean everyone kind of knows in in the music circles which are small and small all the time right. that um for if, if you're going to be doing some sort of cuban or brazilian thing there's you and jeff bush and maybe a co couple other people but those are the mm -hmm. people that specialize in playing those styles well i i never will feel like i you know have really a uh a, a 
grasp of it, you know. Yeah. But I'm trying. I'm learning all the yeah. time. And I'm just uh, saying, you have the to. you have the the cred. <laughs> Everybody knows if you need this done, these well, are the guys you call around here. Oh, well, well, thank you. But uh, <laughs> you're also very humble. Uh, it's just the company. It's the company I keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Um, and what about working with um, Greta? How did you first get in contact with Greta? Because you played with her for many years now as well. Yeah, um, probably early '90s. Uh, you know. I've, Played some gigs with her, um, <clears throat> and then um, you know I met Clipper and started playing with Clipper in Spokane in 1981, okay. and um, you know so so we we've been uh, friends and, and played together. I I probably spent more time on the bandstand with Clipper than any other person. You know? yeah. Well, listening, I've I've played a, a fair amount with you two, and it's it's hand in glove. And I've got to you know see concerts and watch you guys play. And you guys are you have that um, ESP. But you guys have, you've talked to one another musically a lot, and that is very uh, uh, evident in the way that you guys play together. Well, we we've, we've spent time together definitely, <laughs> and uh, it, you know it's it's been a great relationship. Uh, and Clipper started working with Greta. Um, early '90s, uh, and, and yeah, it's, you know, we, so it's been a long association, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, she's wonderful, wonderful band leader, um, and a wonderful improviser. You know, it's it's like playing with a, a great horn player. Uh, so. Well, and Darren Clendenin also works mm -hmm. quite a bit now, yeah, um, yeah. and I, I know she's also worked with Randy Halberstadt as well. Both Darren oh, and Randy yeah, are, yeah. are great arrangers and, and musicians. Yeah. Um, so when coming up with things like, you know, I know Jovino writes a lot of stuff. Is Greta writing and arranging stuff, or is that more coming from the rhythm section, or how is that coming about? Um, she she has written some arrangements, and, and Clipper and, and Greta have written tunes together. Um, she's put lyrics to different things, you know, m more um, instrumental things actually. Um, and and we do some of uh, Clipper's original tunes as a, a quartet or quintet um, with Greta. Um, but you know, just a lot of lot of standards. Uh, Greta's repertoire is vast. And, which is a really cool thing, you know, because you learn a lot of tunes. Um, you know, there's just a lot of variety. And um, do, do you get stumped? Like, did you call tunes that you don't know and you have to go oh, check them yeah, out? Or? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, because some of the tunes that she'll she'll pull out are are really obscure, and you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with them. Um, but uh, you know, it'll be like you know, yeah, you'll hear it. <laughs> Or there will be, a, you know, maybe a chart or something. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so it's a constant, you know, <laughs> more tunes coming in all the time. And especially now, um, she's really trying to find new things, you know, it's to keep, uh, you know, inspired. And, and yeah. she's doing it, so, yeah. yeah. Well, um, beyond those two groups, I mean, you do a lot of sideman work with with lots of other bands, um, at least that I've seen in the time that I've known you. Um, but I, you know, reading your bio, I, I think I talked to you about this before. But you've done some sideman work with Michael Brecker. That was was. Well, it was just one concert, and uh, Clipper was on that as well. Clipper was too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can Can you talk about that? Yes, that I had to be an experience. Well, sure. Yeah, he came to town. There was a a festival in Spokane, and. Um, the the rhythm section that I played in was you know hired to back him up um, and, and in no fact pressure. that pardon no pressure <laughs> it was you know he was he was so cool to work with just you know and uh, just really you know warm and just it was it was a blast actually um, that was that was a really cool experience and uh, I I was you know, in, in Spokane, I had a really good situation, and um, Clipper, you know, was part of that all, all through the 80s. Uh, we got to play with many, um, you know, jazz icons, really, you know, that, that would come to town, and we would get hired to, to play. 
the piano player Danny McCollum was a Berkeley grad, and there was a saxophone player in town, Steve Branco, was a Berkeley grad. Um, and with Clipper and I, we had a, a group called the Jazz Conspiracy, and uh, you know, and we, so we had opportunities to play with with a lot of visiting artists, you know, which was was really cool. A good education too, I'm sure. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I also saw you did some work with Freddie Hubbard. Was that a similar situation or? Same same kind of thing. Yeah. Freddie can you, can you talk down. about that? I'm a huge Freddie fan, as a lot well, of people are. Can you talk yeah, about the gig? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was amazing. Um, you know, and and I should have just done the concert and gone home. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we we hung out and partied with Freddie, and and he he was at the time he was a little bit bitter about uh, Miles and the success of Miles. You know, I mean, I think Freddie was probably doing okay, but, you know, here he was, you know, flying out to Spokane by himself, you know, to play play with a bunch of white youngsters. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so you know, later that night, it, it just, it was, it was not pretty. <laughs> I won't go in into any more details. <laughs> oh, no, no. I've, uh, you know. You were at Cornish at the same time that Hadley Callum was there, and, and we talked about this before, but, you know, Hadley was in Freddie's band, and he was very uh, forthcoming with a lot of stories of being in that band, which I'm sure, I don't know if you ever got a chance. Hadley probably did. Hadley spoke the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe at some point we'll discuss those things on these interviews, but uh, today's yeah. not the day. And Freddie Hubbard is great. We all have uh, oh, things that we're not man. proud of. But. Well, earlier in the 80s, before uh, we got to play with him, we came over to Parnell's, to see uh, Freddie play, yeah. and man, it was it was amazing. I mean, the, the the sound that he got out of the horn was just it was it was beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Diane Sure, working with Diane Sure, a similar yeah. situation yeah. or yeah. all? Yeah. Well, it started in Spokane, definitely. Yeah. You know, um, in fact, the club where I was playing, um, Ankeny's, the top of the Rid Path Hotel. Quite a few um, Seattle groups would come over, and uh, again, you know, we were kind of the house rhythm section, so we got to play with uh, different visiting people. Uh, Diane came over, um, I think, with Overton a, a few times. Overton Berry, Overton for those Barry. that don't know, you're Overton Berry, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, and so we worked with with Diane, and then uh, after I moved over here. I I did a, a gig gig with her. Um, so when you were playing in the eighties, I was um, I was born in seventy. I'm a little bit younger. I'm not talking <laughs> trash, but um, you, you were you were on the scene playing professionally before I was. Um, so in the eighties, did you see a lot of musicians, you know, larger name artists that were not touring with their bands? They were using rhythm sections from town to town for places that, that they went. Was that becoming more common? Well, I, I'm sure it, it happened, and it definitely happened in Spokane. Um, uh, you know, because there were there were many like front people that just came as guest artists, and they they maybe they couldn't bring their whole band or um, just didn't. You know, <laughs> uh, but it, it was great for us. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael Brecker, we played with him, and then later he came back and brought a group. Um, so maybe it was that kind of thing where go to town and, and see how things go with the local you know <laughs> rhythm section, and then somehow get um, you know opportunity to come back with a whole band. Maybe that was a little bit of what was happening. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's see. So you're in. Uh, you, did you move to Seattle first? Tacoma. Tacoma. Okay. 1990, yeah. Okay, and then from Tacoma now you're in Gig Harbor? Or yeah. Did, did you ever yeah. live in Seattle or is Tacoma no, now? No, no. Okay. Just been commuting. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm right there with you. I understand. It's no fun these days. Um, I haven't been doing a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, well, prior to sheltering in place. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, I first met you 
um, had to be when you were playing with Tracy Canope and um, you were doing working with him, and probably down either at Red Kelly's or at um, uh, what was the one on Pack Ave? I can't Downtown, believe it. Yeah. yeah, Drake's. Drake's. Drake's yeah, yep. which is now yeah. Dorky's Arcade. I remember that. Um, yeah. So, how did you first meet Tracy? You know, it might have been on that gig. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not sure, you know, if there was maybe I I might have done like a big band thing that he was, you know, in the, in the sax section. I may, may have met him before that. But if I remember correctly, that gig, uh, Buddy Catlow was on bass. Mm-hmm. And Tracy... Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we keep throwing out these names here. We're, we're just having a conversation. We keep talking about all these musicians. The some of you days. know, yeah. Some yeah. of you know what we're talking about. Some of you probably have no clue. But um, these are all um, many of them musicians here in the Northwest that are very well known. So um, we're talking about saxophonist Tracy Canope, who's a great player and educator. And um, hi Tracy. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> hi Tracy. Um, he's watching the game. <laughs> probably. If the game's not going well, he's probably yelling a lot too. But. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so, so that's where I first met you. And then um, I, when I um, went to start studying at Cornish College of the Arts, um, I was looking through the faculty, and I saw that you were on the faculty there. Um, so how did you start teaching at Cornish, and when did that whole come about? And uh, Gary Gibson was on the faculty, and uh, Gary was doing a lot of teaching, uh, teaching, you know, theory classes and um ensembles and uh, drum set students and I think he he wanted to cut back um, on some hours and so the the private drum set instruction uh, kind of opened up and um, this was you know about the time that I started working with Joe Vino and Chuck and um, I just uh, applied and you know (laughs) So you were there from, this started, you said, in the late 90s until? Yeah, about 20 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 97 to 2017. Okay. Around there. And then also, actually, wait, I lied. That's not true because you were teaching at Olympic, Olympic College. College. Yeah. That's, you were teaching there yeah. as well when uh, I yeah. first got there. Yeah. That, that would remember, have been 1998. That's when I started attending okay. there prior to Cornish. Yeah. So when did you start teaching at Olympic College? Early 90s, probably just shortly after I got to Tacoma. I started teaching a little bit part-time at uh, Pierce College and uh, Olympic College. Then um, I think I taught a little bit at uh, Pacific Lutheran just because they needed, you know, a drum set instructor or something. Yes. Who was the he- well, so when you first started and you're still teaching at Pacific Lutheran University? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who was leading the um, the band when you first got there? The big band, jazz band. Well, back in the '90s, I I, I don't even remember, you know, if they uh, had a program, you know, <laughs> and who um, who was doing it that that time, because I wasn't really connected other than you know teaching a, a private drum student uh but then when i got back into uh the jazz faculty at uh, pacific lutheran uh, david deacon joiner was the jazz the head of the jazz department yeah. I, I remember when he first moved to town and uh, i remember him coming to a jam session at jazz bones and sitting in and playing and be like whoa you know who's this guy Great uh, piano player. Great. Uh, I yeah. need to have him on one of these. Uh, David, if you're watching, we'll yeah. get you on one of these eventually. Oh, yeah. David's great. He's um, so let's see. What else was I going to ask you? Oh, I ask all all the musicians that come on this um, <laughs> because we're, we're constantly, all of us, we're constantly growing and learning and, and learning more and more and developing as musicians. Um, but uh, looking back, kn- knowing now what you know now versus when you were first getting started and as, as you know, working with so many students over the years, um, what are some things that you've learned that have really helped you um, develop as a musician? You know, light bulbs that have gone off that have really helped you grow, and you think that are very important to convey those ideas to students now. And the reason I ask is, like, I have certain things that I can remember vividly. Like, I learned this thing, and it really, like, unlocked a lot of things for me, and I try to impart that to students when I'm working with them. So are, are there any things that you want to share that you think have been things that have been helpful for you? 
Uh, it's a big question. It is. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, would you repeat that? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I, I know I, I've kind of, uh, as I've been a player, I've always been a teacher. And, you know, even when I was in, in high school, um, I started teaching my teachers beginners, um, he had a, and this is another um, a very important teacher uh, that I should mention. His name was Howie Robbins and um, taught in the Spokane Valley. And uh, <clears throat> that's where I really got the foundation, you know, my, <laughs> how to hold the sticks and, <laughs> you know, um, play paradiddles and, and um, you know, got my foundation. So... Um, Something, just, something good just happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I don't know if, if uh, the, the mics are probably not picking it up, but the game's going on, and you can hear the the neighborhood going nuts. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, so when when I was um, in high school, I started teaching with uh, my teacher, and uh, and I've I've always, when I was in college, I would have a few students. Um, and then, you know, after college, of course, I started teaching and, and then, you know, got on to different um, part-time faculties, you know, at different schools. Um, um, and so I've always been learning and teaching at the same time, kind of. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm a better teacher now than, you know, I was even, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and I, I try to, um, keep growing and, and, and learning, you know, about playing, but also about teaching. And, um, and I always also just try to approach each student individually, not just have some, you know, uh, one size fits all. Yeah, just point. a program. This is you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this. And, you know, I try to find things that um, will uh, help the student, you know, progress and and be inspired. And well, everybody's um, got everybody <laughs> has di uh, different different needs. I mean, and everyone learns differently. Some people yeah. are more visual. Some people are more auditory. Some people are more yeah. tactile. You know, very true. So. Very true. Okay, well, keep an eye on the time here. Um, the last 15 minutes, we always open things up for questions from oh, listeners. Sure. So um, sure. if anyone has questions for Mark uh, that you would like to know about his uh, um, history or playing or advice or expertise, feel free to uh, write it in, in the comments there, and we will get to them and uh, go from there. Are, are there any questions? <laughs> yes. So the oh. question is, um, in playing the drums, what's a memorable gig where the, the sound was good? Yeah, because some rooms sound terrible. Boosters. You could say that for any instrument, but, yeah. Do yeah. you have a memorable gig where the sound was, like, really, 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 like, you really enjoyed it? Well, um, yeah, um, I, I'm sure. Um, actually, there's probably more places where the sound was really bad you know, <laughs> than, than great. And, and one thing that happens is um, every time you play in a different environment – you know it's a different feeling and sometimes it takes a while to get used to that um feeling you know the the sound and uh, you know like playing at Tula's you know played there maybe hundreds of times um and uh, so you you just get comfortable you know with whatever the situation is um uh, you know, I remember a gig that was like in a backyard in a in a patio of a house, and for some reason the acoustics were just just amazing, you know, and everything just sounded so crisp and clear, and, and it was like beautiful. But you know, of course, <laughs> only happened once. Uh, uh, but I think uh, the thing is, um, you just have to be flexible, and you have to be able to 
just sort of roll with whatever the uh, situation is. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes, you, you know, you have a monitor that uh, just you can hear everything and you feel so comfortable, you know, playing. And, and then um, other times it's it's not like that. Um, yeah, so I, I can't think of, you know, too many really wonderful, great experiences. But, I mean, there, there have been lots, um, but that's sort of... The, Sure, sure. Uh, did you ever have to play um, extra loud on cover or on the show? So the question <laughs> is, <laughs> that's did, did you ever have to play <laughs> loud to cover unpleasant playing? I'm assuming that's from other <laughs> other musicians in the band. Well, I've, um, I have been asked to play loud, um, you know, maybe because it's a situation where there's not a really good PA system and you know so there's not a lot of reinforcement and and you know there's a big crowd and they need to hear the band but you know <laughs> so play louder you know <laughs> uh <laughs> but th I don't think I've ever been asked to play loud just to cover anything <laughs> you, you try not to cover up people if you can help it but uh, yeah. sometimes I guess you may want to I guess um, any, any questions no questions all right. Well, everybody's watching the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh. Um, okay. Well, so now, how long have you been teaching at Ted Brown Music as one of their instructors? Ah, oh, boy. Um, yeah, good question. Um, probably six or seven years, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'd been a customer there for for many many years. In fact, uh, uh, my buddy Dave Heath, who's worked there for forever, um, I've known him since the early 90s. He was at uh, Keith Purvis Drum Shop in Burien. Um, and, you know, I started going there after I moved um, over to Tacoma. After we moved here, I'd go up there, <coughs> and uh, Dave would be there with... Mr. Purvis, and uh, so I got to know Dave <clears throat> when he was doing that, and then uh, Keith s sold that uh, drum shop, and uh, Dave, I, th I think Dave was at a s music store in Auburn for a little while, and then then he was at Ted Brown, yeah. and uh, but he's you know so he's been taking care of me yeah. since their you know 1990 or something, uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I would always go into Ted Brown, and um, one one time I think I just asked him, hey, you know, was there any opening for a, you know, private drum instructor here? I know, you know, the, they had the studios back there, and, um, and so I said, yeah, sure. Well, we're, we're very glad to have you there. <laughs> uh, trust me, it's yeah, it's a good oh, thing oh. for everyone in the city of Tacoma and the surrounding uh, areas. Um, okay, and then. Uh, so aside from, so now currently you're teaching at Ted Brown. If someone wanted to get in touch with you to learn, I mean, I believe the information's on Ted Brown's website. Um, do you have a website that you also use for teaching or the ways for people that can find uh, you know, information to get in touch with you? Nah, just, um, you know, Facebook or, um, you know, email. Or, um, yeah, through Ted Brown or through PLU. Um, you know, that's another possible way. Or they can call you. <laughs> I'm happy. I take a small, small percentage, you know, of a, as an agent fee, but ha happy to do that. Happy to do that. Um, any other questions? Any questions for Mark? No. All right. Uh, well, um, so you've been, I, I see you've been doing some streams with uh, Greta, and I think, is there something coming up with Jovino? Or? There is. Uh, with Jovino, October 24th from uh, Town Hall. Oh. It's uh, part of the You're Earshot right? uh, Festival. Looking forward to that. Uh, Live stream. Huh? Oh, okay. And then um, any yeah. stuff coming up with Greta? You guys doing any projects? There will be, and I can't remember the date um, off the top of my head, but I know we have a date set aside for another live stream um, thing. Yeah. And besides uh, Jovino and Greta, are there, are there any other groups that you've been working with or doing any streams with over the last? couple months just here just the uh, cream candy <laughs> world orchestra <laughs> <Yeah>. no uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, 
I, I did a, a socially distanced uh, outdoor concert, and um, I'm not sure that it was totally <laughs> sanctioned and legal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everybody was safe, and um, uh, uh, that was in August. So I actually have a, a question for you in regards to socially distanced learning and, and teaching online. You know, um, prior to sheltering in place, I'd, I'd been working with some students in um, some different states and things occasionally or, or students that want to go on vacation and still have lessons. Uh -huh. I don't know why, but they would do that. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't completely foreign to me, um, but, uh, you know, teaching horn, you know, saxophone, flute, clarinet, or piano via the internet is not it's not too problematic you can figure your systems out um yeah. with drum set are there any challenges that you've encountered teaching remotely that oh have yeah been the, the audio you know is not great probably on either end you know um just with an iphone or an ipad or whatever um but uh i've you know it, it does work and 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 it's i think it's okay and i, I had never done it I had never done Skype lessons until they sent everybody home from um, from PLU. Right. So I had to do my um, college students that way, and then Ted Brown shut down, and I had to do my private students uh, there that way. Um, and I, you know, I called uh, Gary Williams, who's yeah. you know a great teacher, a great drummer, and and does a lot of uh, Skype lessons, and I asked him, you know, how do I do it? Yeah. <laughs> he just said, well, all you need is, you know, an iPhone uh, or an iPad or, uh, you know, a laptop or whatever. And, and a lot of patience. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I just I just got started with it, and uh, yeah. so far I'm, I'm not back to teaching, you know, in person um, yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Well, we've got about five minutes left. Any questions for Mark at this time? No. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, in regards to, let's see, um, live streams, you've been able to do some of that. You're still doing teaching. Are there any other projects or things coming up um, that you're working on or working with other people, like uh, remote, like some people putting together, like, remote recordings and things like that? Have you done any of that kind of stuff? Or um, not live streams, but, like, you know, piecing yes. together different yeah, um with with Jovino, we we did one um, uh, video and audio, uh, kind of, you know, piece together thing, and it was you know very challenging to get everything to sync up, you know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and since then, we've done a couple more that were just audio, and um, so we didn't have to deal with. Uh, video and, and syncing video to audio. Uh, but I have done a couple uh, video and audio projects with uh, PLU jazz faculty yeah. and uh, with Casio uh, yeah. Viana. And, and he, he does a great job of editing and putting them together. And so there, there have been those kinds of uh, projects. And I have done, although I don't have a great recording setup at home, I can record and I've done a little bit of, you know, re just recording drum tracks for people. So if people need home. tracks, they can also call you and, and enlist your services. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just making sure we know that. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. And um, I did not put this in the um, uh, the beginning of the post here, but um, email address for those that want to contact you is? Uh, uh, Mark at partpredominant.com. It's a good one. Uh, so p a r t p r e d o m i n a n t dot com. Okay. Just want to make sure we get all the, so <laughs> all the stuff. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, um, we are gonna uh, we're gonna conclude here. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, and, Craig. Uh, and thanks, thanks for having me. Of course, and thanks to everybody for watching. Um, we're gonna take uh, a brief interlude here and get things set up, and then we're gonna do a broadcast with Mark on drums and Greg on bass and a whole new batch of. Uh, brand new original compositions and we'll see what happens so Looking uh forward to playing yeah me too we'll be back in just a moment thanks for joining us